welcome. Uh, before introducing uh, today's speaker, Dr. David Levy, uh, and in lieu of announcing upcoming events, which I usually do, uh, I'd like to thank a few people um, who made today's Just Lunch a 25th anniversary celebration uh, too, and uh, to uh, to mix metaphors and millennia and continents, um, our prime mover and uh, fielder of dreams, uh, Professor Noam Stillman, uh, is here with us from Jerusalem. Uh, he uh, persisted in the face of uh, personal loss and plenty of red tape uh, to build a uh, faculty and a constituency for Jewish studies uh, here at OU. And uh, if Trice isn't frantically helping other people get on, uh, or I think I'll do this myself, um, since I know he is, uh, let me just say, uh, if you could unmute yourselves for a minute, just to give Noam a actual uh, round of applause. Uh, Noam, uh, the Schusterman family, and former President David Bourne uh, formed a threefold cord, which uh, Ecclesiastes tells us is not easily broken, and so far it hasn't been. Um, the OU uh, Schusterman Center of Judaic and Israel studies, and there, there are only there are only two others in the United States has also benefited uh, by being housed in the highly functional history department and has uh, enjoyed the support of uh, chairs Rob Griswold, who's with us, and uh, Jamie Hart, who may or may not be, I can't see all the faces anymore. Uh, Rob actually drafted the contours of an MA program, which we have uh, finally put into practice this year. And uh, both Rob and Jamie have been uh, effective advocates for our faculty. Uh, I might say especially our younger faculty, uh, Israel Studies Chair, Dr. Rona Seidelman, uh, who I see here, and uh, our Americanist, Dr. Ronnie Grinberg, whose uh, adorable baby Ruben you all saw earlier. Uh, earlier in the uh, program. Um, we look forward uh, to working uh, with the new chair, uh, whoever she may be. Uh, considerations of time uh, make it simply impossible to acknowledge all the affiliated faculty who have consistently contributed their talents, ideas, and efforts. Uh, thanks to them, we are diverse, at least in so far as gender, religion, ethnicity, geography, mother tongue, and background, which surely counts for something, and not only diverse, but altogether interdisciplinary. Within the last few weeks alone, uh, Misha Klein from Anthropology, Daniel Simon from World Literature Today, uh, Janet Ward, uh, incoming German Studies Association president and vice president for research, have suggested various speakers and programs. This has become our norm and to our enormous benefit as we continually broaden uh, our conversation as to what Jewish studies might entail. Everything we do, uh, and we don't say this nearly enough, stems from the interests of our wonderful students, most of whom overcome many hurdles to get here to OU, and all of whom could choose to take other classes. There are easier ways to earn a BA at the University of Oklahoma than studying medieval martyrdom, Jews and other Germans, or the Bible since the Enlightenment. So, so I, I want to thank all of our, our wonderful students who I see many of them on, on the screen today. Uh, there are 
uh, there are a lot of adjectives that could be used to describe the year 2020. And even by my lax standards, those are mainly unspeakable. Uh, uh, while uh, while it is, is great to invite speakers from world over at minimal cost, uh, while it is great to save our good friends in Oklahoma City and Tulsa the trouble of hunting for parking spaces, we would gladly trade it all in exchange to see everyone this year healthy and safe, to know that we would all be free to give all of our friends and all of our family members a hug. And of course, uh, not least, uh, we look forward to being able to host everybody face to face soon, uh, well vaccinated in the near future. Um, we remain uh, remote by uh, uh, medical necessity, not by choice or inclination. Uh, that acknowledged. Uh, it's quite quite fitting, I think, to say Shahech uh, So glad that we made it here. Um, so glad that you're here today. Um, uh, again, the main event uh, is still to come, Professor David Levy. But uh, before I introduce him, we have uh, a couple of special guests, uh, and truly neither of them need an introduction either. Uh, the uh, Merrick uh, Chair and Boren Professor and Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, um, our good friend, uh, Dr. David Robel. And uh, Ms. Lynn Schusterman, uh, Chair Emerita of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, uh, who I might say has done more for Judaic and Israel studies than a passel of PhDs, Dean Robel. Uh, uh, Dean, uh, would you mind un unmuting yourself and, and saying, right. saying a few things? Oh, thanks so much, Alan, and welcome, everybody. Uh, first, I I'd like to take a moment to thank Professor Alan Levinson, the, the director of the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies, and the Schusterman Josie Chair in Judaic History for providing me with the opportunity to say a few words of thanks on what is a momentous anniversary occasion. Alan, you've been an inspiring, deeply dedicated, and wonderfully effective leader of the center, and I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to work with you, both as a history department colleague and as a representative of the college. I, I'd also like to uh, offer my thanks to Noam Stillman, the founding director of the center. Noam, today's successes in building this outstanding program rest on the foundations of your vision, first articulated more than a quarter of a century ago for the University of Oklahoma to become an international leader in Judaic and Israel studies. Thank you, Noam, for that inspired vision and the two decades of hard work and dedication that went into bringing it to fruition. I'd also like to uh, thank the two department chairs uh, whose tenure has coincided with the, uh, the first quarter century uh, of the center. Uh, so Rob Griswold, uh, thank you for hiring me. Uh, and uh, Jamie Hart. Um, next, I'd like to take a moment to thank our very special guest, Lynn Schusterman. Lynn, your confidence in Noam's and Alan's vision for the center and your generous and consistent support have built something quite remarkable here at OU. One of the great intellectual centers for the field of Judaic and Israel studies. But I'd like to go a step further and say what we all on this Zoom session already know. This is one of the great intellectual centers in the nation for the study of culture and humanity. And this center exists and it thrives in no small part because the Schusterman Center recognizes the value of its contributions, not just to this university in this state, but to the nation and the larger global arena of Judaic studies and humanistic endeavor. Lynn Schusterman, thank you for your faith in the potential of this center 25 years ago and for your generosity in supporting its endeavors then and now. Last, I'd like to say a little bit more about why the Schusterman Center is such a vitally important part of the College of Arts and Sciences and the University of Oklahoma. Intellectual community builds mutual understanding and respect. Mutual understanding and respect move communities, societies, and humanity forward. Universities are vital sites for this humanistic building project. The more fragile the world seems to become, 
the more tattered and torn and unraveled the ties of human understanding become, the more vital universities are as sites of humanistic renewal and rejuvenation and healing. Universities are the cultural glue and the enduring ties that bind us together. Hello. Those of you who are joining us today have seen the work of community building and healing that the Schusterman Center does every day. Think of the many departments in the College of Arts and Sciences bound together by the Schusterman Center, including anthropology, classics and letters, English, history, modern languages, linguistics, uh, and literatures and religious studies, and other colleges too, including fine arts and honors and international studies. Think about the consistently large audiences who attend the Just Lunch Brown Bag lecture series that so many of our core and associated Judaic and Israel studies faculty present in. Think about the high powered discussions at those events. Think about the distinguished presenters in the Yedida K. Stillman Memorial Lecture Series. Consider the students in our program who've had one of the transformative cultural and intellectual experiences of their lives studying in Israel. Consider the impressive accomplishments of those students and the impressive body of publications crafted by the center's core and associated faculty. And think about the ways in which the Schusterman Center communications, the website and the newsletter among them, consistently celebrate the accomplishments of every member of this community and in doing so make it more unified and more intellectually vibrant. I'd venture that Judaic and Israel studies nationally and internationally is made markedly stronger by OU Schusterman Center and that our university community is the palace of humanistic thought on the prairie that it is in no small part because of the work of the Schusterman Center and I'm convinced that the intellectual core of our university strengthened and deepened as it is by the center makes us a national and international site of humanistic renewal and rejuvenation. So thank you to our brilliant Judaic Studies Corps and Associated Faculty, our equally brilliant students. Thank you to Alan and Noam for your leadership, to all of the outstanding staff over the years who've devoted their time and expertise to this enterprise. Thank you to the community members who support the Schusterman Center by attending our events and contributing to our discussions and thereby making our community more meaningful. Okay. And thank you again, Lynn Schusterman and the Schusterman okay. Foundation for believing in a vision and supporting a transformation. It's been a wonderful first 25 years. Here's to the next quarter century and to the many more momentous anniversaries to come. The College of Arts and Sciences is truly grateful for the Schusterman Center. Happy anniversary. Thank you so much, David. That's why he's the dean. Uh, and uh, I, did, I did hear a voice um, Remotely, I think, but not so remotely. Uh, uh, Lynn, is that is that you on the line? Yes, I'm listening. <laughs> I hate well, modern technology, but I'm thrilled with the first 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> well said. I say, I'll just. I want to thank everyone, just like like you did, because without everyone's involvement, this would not be here 25 years later. And what I'm hoping is to paraphrase that often Jewish sentiment next year in person, not Zoom. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening on the phone. Wonderful. wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, and, and again, th uh, Dean Robel, thank you so much for your, for your uh, words. Uh, always so sage. Um, okay. It's my great privilege. Uh, to introduce um, yet another person who doesn't need introducing today, this seems to be the theme, uh, Professor uh, David Levy. Um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Levy, uh, 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 now, now the Emeritus uh, Rothbaum Professor uh, uh, of American History here at uh, OU. Uh, for those of you who have just arrived at OU, and there are some quite a few students here, uh, Professor Levy, uh, in addition to having uh, edited the Brandeis letters, having uh, uh, having uh, written uh, books on Mark Twain, FDR's fireside chat chats, the debate over Vietnam, uh, uh, and so many uh, other. Uh, wonderful publications. Uh, uh, he uh, actually, uh, for again, this, I think the undergraduates may 
find this uh, uh, both impressive and intimidating, uh, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, I think David first broke uh, international attention with his uh, book on Herbert Crowley uh, and the New Republic, uh, The Life of a Progressive in 1985. Uh, I am astonished looking at his CV to say that he has not taken his foot off the gas since then and uh, is a, a beloved uh, uh, teacher, uh, 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 a cherished colleague, uh, somebody who uh, always, you always want to spend more time with David. Uh, he has far too many accomplishments um, to enumerate here because it would just take up all of his time uh, speaking. Uh, uh, he was willing to do it last year when we were going to do this live. He, uh, in typical David Levy fashion, said, I'll do it on Zoom and I'll learn how to do PowerPoint too. Uh, uh, and uh, for those of you who are not going to see David every day uh, uh, because we're all on lockdown still, uh, you can at least the next time you go into Dale Hall Tower, take a moment to look at the one picture in uh, our lobby. And if you're wondering what David Levy looks like in oil, well, that's it. But you're not going to get to see him in oil today. You'll have to see him on a, a Zoom panel. Uh, David and I spoke about the topic. He decided that he'd like to say a little bit about um, Jewish professors at OU before there was a Jewish studies program. I actually forgot the precise title of his talk, but it doesn't matter because he's always wonderful. And uh, here he is, the one and only, <laughs> Dr. David Levy. David? Uh, <clears throat> I think that's enough for today. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Alan, for that uh, kind, if somewhat extravagant uh, introduction. Uh, it's a, a pleasure and an honor, really, to uh, talk to you all on this particularly auspicious occasion. Uh, I'll repeat what the Dean has said. The Judaic Studies program at the university has been a model of distinguished teaching and scholarship, a model, uh, really, of uh, serious intellectual life at its best. The stimulating lectures, dozens of them, the learned books and uh, articles by uh, this remarkable uh, faculty, the fascinating courses, the thousands of students, graduate and undergraduate, uh, Jew and non-Jew alike, uh, whose educations have been enhanced and whose outlook has been broadened, uh, one is really struck by uh, how much of quality, uh, of uh, very great quality, has been accomplished in so short a time. It, it's a record that promises a, uh, a, a magnificent future. Uh, but my assignment uh, uh, this afternoon, however, is to chat with you for 40 or 45 minutes, uh, if you can stand it, uh, about the past, not the future. The Jewish presence at the University of Oklahoma before the arrival of the Judaic Studies uh, program. Uh, I know you'll understand that there's much more that can be said about that topic uh, than there is time to say it. Uh, but as Alan mentioned, after a lot of reflection about what to talk about, I've decided to uh, devote the bulk of my allotted time to remembering the first two Jewish professors who uh, taught here. I think that choice would be different for me were these two not so uh, extraordinary, such uh, pioneers uh, in their fields. And, uh, and uh, I hope to persuade you so uh, eminently worthy of our uh, remembrance uh, on an occasion like this. 
but before turning to those two, I feel some obligation to uh, uh, nod with uh, unpardonable brevity to two other aspects of Jews in the university. First, uh, what can be said about the history of Jewish students here? Uh, as it happens, uh, uh, not very much. Uh, in the first place, with the exception of those who joined Jewish fraternities and sororities, it's hard to know who was Jewish. It's almost uh, certain that there were some Jewish students here from the very beginning. The uh, first entering class of uh, 1892, 93 had in it a Hattie Jacobs, uh, a George Levy, L-E-A-V-Y, an Odessa Wallace, an Anna Kohler, were they? I don't know. Uh, hard, to, hard to find out. Uh, there were about 100 Jews in Oklahoma Territory in 1890 and about 1,000 uh, in uh, 1901. So it is uh, quite likely that there was a minuscule Jewish representation on the enormous campus uh, in those early days. A little notice in the uh, student newspaper on uh, February 7th, 1914, 22 years into the uh, school's history. Uh, a small group of eight or 10 Jewish students, all males, uh, gathered at the home of a longtime professor of Latin, Joseph Paxton, and started a chapter of the Menorah Society, a, uh, I don't know if you know it, a uh, national organization of Jewish college students begun at Harvard in 1906. Uh, the rabbi from Oklahoma City uh, traveled down to Norman on that occasion and uh, gave a talk on the philosophy of religion. In 1923, uh, the university took a religious census among its uh, 3,600 students, uh, 2,900 of whom were willing to disclose their uh, religious affiliations. Uh, as you might have expected, 83% of the student body were members of one of the five most populous Protestant denominations, but there were also uh, 48 uh, Jews. Uh, incidentally, the same number of Christian scientists, 48. But 48 Jews accounted for uh, a little less than 2% of the student uh, population. By this time, uh, the early 20s, there were enough Jews to start a group of uh, fraternities and sororities. Uh, Sigma Alpha Mu opened a chapter in September 1920, Pi Lambda Phi in 22, a sorority, Sigma Delta Tau began in uh, Edo on September 14th, 1921. Other Greek houses came and merged and disappeared uh, with uh, new ones uh, starting as late as the mid-1950s. At their height, <clears throat> there were probably three fraternities and two or maybe three sororities functioning at the uh, same time. By the fall of 1943, there were enough Jews on the campus to warrant the opening of uh, a Hillel Foundation. Uh, I learned from uh, Mr. Philip Goldfarb, uh, a uh, quite uh, an ominously knowledgeable historian of Jewish life in Tulsa and Oklahoma, uh, that uh, in uh, 1945, serious fundraising began for a new building on the corner of Elm and uh, Boyd, uh, a, uh, a fundraising campaign under the direction of uh, Julius Livingston of uh, Tulsa. Uh, ground was broken for that uh, building and uh, the existing building in 1951. In addition to its religious functions, of course, it all functioned as a social center for Jewish students, especially those who weren't members of uh, fraternities and sororities. 
a press release issued at the time of the groundbreaking uh, estimates that uh, there were around 300 uh, Jewish students in 1951 out of about 8,000 total students. Uh, that is roughly uh, three and eight tenths percent of uh, the student body. By the mid 50s, uh, Jewish students began to come to OU in somewhat larger numbers, mostly because of uh, determined efforts at uh, recruitment by uh, uh, OU. Recruiters, including uh, some Jewish students, uh, started to make annual trips to heavily Jewish out of state uh, high schools, New Trier, Deerfield in Chicago, uh, Bel Air in Houston, similar places in St. Louis and Omaha, Denver, Memphis, uh, Kansas City. And soon counselors at those high schools were uh, suggesting to Jewish students the, the possibility of coming to Norman. An estimate of uh, Jewish population at the university in 1960 was 400 to 500 uh, individuals, uh, still roughly about uh, less than 4%, or around 3.8% of the student population. Uh, it is probable that uh, more than a few of those who came were on the hunt for uh, marriage uh, partners. Uh, but, uh, of course, the same could be said for many uh, non-Jewish students as well. Today, the Hillel homepage estimates a uh, Jewish uh, student population of about 150 to 250 roughly around 1% uh, of the present student body. But uh, I emphasize that uh, nobody knows uh, for certain. Uh, Jewish students seem to have participated fully in uh, campus-wide organizations. They can be found in uh, the university choir and in the orchestra and on athletic teams and in the debate society and in literary and philanthropic uh, clubs and honoraries in the ROTC and uh, student government and so on. On the other hand, Jewish social uh, life uh, and uh, social activities seems uh, until very late in the story uh, to have been conducted largely separately. Uh, isolated from the rest of uh, the campus. Uh, for example, Jewish uh, fraternities, like African-American ones when they got started, uh, conducted their uh, recruitment rushes separately from the white and uh, Christian houses during different weeks. Uh, in February of 1969, the Interfraternity Council uh, did away with that practice and held just one rush week for all students. Uh, but uh, a uh, Pan-Hellenic spokeswoman uh, frankly remarked uh, on that occasion that the sororities had uh, done that, uh, done a similar thing 15 years earlier, but she added, the sororities are, quote, very precisely either WASP or Jewish. There are a lot of nice words signifying nothing. Uh, there are no doubt numerous uh, exceptions, but I will venture the uh, bold generalization that Jewish students tended to be, again with uh, numerous exceptions, well to the left politically of uh, the rest of the student body. There are several indications uh, of this. Uh, the organizer of the largest anti-segregation rally in 1948, more than a thousand students, a huge percentage of the student body then, uh, who uh, gathered on the North Oval, heard speeches, burned a copy of the 14th Amendment, 
put its ashes into uh, an envelope, marched to the post office, mailed the envelope to President Truman with a note saying that apparently the equal protection of the law uh, clause of that amendment was uh, dead in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. The organizer of and the choreographer of that uh, event was young Howard Friedman. Uh, Jews were prominent uh, in the uh, Young Democrats and in protests during the 1960s. I wonder if you know this. On January 10th, 1950, a, a group of uh, fraternity boys from the most reactionary, racist, and pro-Southern fraternity on the campus, Kappa Alpha, burned a cross on the lawn of the Hillel uh, building. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, there's some evidence to support that, that this incident was less about anti-Semitism than it was about uh, anti-communism, because that night, Alan Shaw, the chair of the Oklahoma Communist Party, had come down from Oklahoma City to give a talk in the building. Uh, and uh, I don't mean to elaborate this too much, but uh, uh, in evidence that later emerged, the uh, Kappa Alphas tried to recruit others to come. And the way they recruited them is by saying, would you like to smoke out a bunch of commies, not a bunch of Jews? Anyway, there you are. Uh, <clears throat> I want to... This is a little self-indulgent. I want to uh, conclude this uh, too brief consideration of Jewish students at OU by mentioning one of them, one young man I think worthy of uh, 90 seconds of uh, our attention. Uh, let me see. I want to show his picture, but now I don't know how to do it. Uh, uh, oh, here. Just a second. Do you see his picture? Click share. Share, right. Got him? Alan, can you see him? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, his unlikely name uh, was uh, Giovanni Rossi Lominitz. Uh, he was born in uh, Bryan, Texas in 1921. His extremely radical father named him after an Italian socialist, uh, uh, maybe anarchist. Uh, he graduated from high school at the age of 14 came to OU, earned a degree in physics in 1940 when he was 18. One of his teachers happened to be George Lynn Cross, then a professor of botany. Uh, Cross recalled that Lomanitz had, and I'm quoting Cross now, the reputation of being perhaps the most brilliant student to have attended the University of Oklahoma up until that time. I had taught Lominitz in a beginning botany class. I had realized the first week of class that his intellectual capacity was truly extraordinary beyond anything that I had seen in a student. It soon became apparent that the content of the beginning course could not challenge him in any way. <clears throat> I excused him from regular class attendance and assigned him advanced readings in plant physiology. His final paper would have been a worthy introduction to a doctoral dissertation. Lominitz was a committed radical, maybe a communist. Uh, if not, uh, he hung around with a lot of uh, admitted uh, communists. Uh, after graduation, he went to Berkeley uh, to uh, become us uh, to work with J. Robert Oppenheimer. He finished a PhD in physics at Cornell uh, under Richard Feynman. 
when Oppenheimer was in, investigated for uh, 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 subversive activities in the 50s, Lomenitz was uh, called to testify but uh, refused. And his refusal to give evidence, uh, Cross wrote, uh, ended what might have been a brilliant career in nuclear science. He was thereafter regarded as a security risk and could find no employment in keeping with his talents. Uh, Lomenitz made uh, occasional returns, at least one that I know of, uh, to the Norman campus in connection with uh, continuing leftist uh, political activity. He worked uh, at various tarred roofs, trimmed trees, repaired railroad tracks at $1.35 an hour. Uh, Cross called him one of the major tragedies of the misguided witch hunts that characterized the, MacArthur, the McCarthy era. In 1959, he finally got a uh, teaching job at uh, the New Mexico Institute of Mining. Uh, he retired from there in 1991 and moved to Hawaii, where he died in 2003. Um, I wish now to touch on a second uh, aspect of uh, Jewish history at OU before turning to those uh, two uh, professors. Uh, it would be hard to imagine uh, what this place would be like today without the contributions of a group of uh, Jewish philanthropists. Together they have pumped uh, countless millions of dollars into various projects befit, uh, benefiting uh, this institution, especially if you translate those dollars uh, donated in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s into today's value. Uh, they have transformed the university and taken as a group, they'd be more than worthy of a, a talk uh, entirely devoted to their contributions. What would the School of Social Work be uh, without the Zaro family or the Human Relations Department without Sylvan Goldman? or the Judaic Studies program, or the Tulsa campus without the Schustermans, or the College of Business without uh, Michael Price, or uh, the College of Fine Arts without the Weizenhoffers. An entire hour, I think, could be spent on uh, Julian, discussing Julian Rothbaum's impact on the university through his judicious contributions to many disciplines and through his service as an outstanding uh, region. What about uh, the Max, Weisten, uh, Max uh, Westheimer Airfield, the Neustadt Prize in Literature, the Doris Neustadt addition to the Bazell Library? There were dozens of others, uh, uh, the Livingstons, the Berries, the Prices, the Jangers, the Singers, the Schoenfelds, the Galoobs. I am, uh, more, I'll bet you a dollar, I have uh, left out some very important names and I apologize for that. Many of them were connected with the oil business uh, and a goodly number were part of the Jewish communities in Tulsa and Ardmore and uh, their generosity over uh, the years has uh, done much to make this university a respectable uh, institution of higher education. Uh, and they constitute an important story, part of the story of the Jewish presence here. Okay, uh, that having been said, let me now turn to uh, the two pioneering professors that I mentioned at the outset. Uh, the university did not hire a Jewish teacher until a quarter of a century into its history. In 1916, the uh, mathematics department, um, let's see, I want to share, yep, 
just a second. The mathematics department uh, hired uh, Nathan Altshuler. Well, no one is more tired of technology than me or inept. There it goes. Um, Well, I don't see him. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Double click on him, David. And uh, Nathan. Ah, there he is. Uh, that's Nathan Altshuler. He was at the time 35 years old, then teaching at the University of Colorado. He was born in Russia, what's today Poland, uh, was educated in Europe, doctorate from the University of Ghent in 1911, did graduate, came up to America, did graduate work at Columbia, taught there, then at the University of Washington, then, at, uh, 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 then uh, came to uh, Colorado. One of his recommenders uh, uh, for his, the job here wrote, uh, as a gentleman, scholar, mathematician, and capable and approved instructor, you may confidently rely upon him. He is in good health and takes a sane view of things. <clears throat> he is a native Russian, but he has mastered our language, speaking fluently and plainly, though of course with a foreign accent. Uh, a second letter on his behalf mentioned that for some 10 days, the students find it a little difficult to understand his speech. After that, they have no difficulty. I have not the slightest difficulty in understanding him. He seems to be, to me, to be an excellent man, a little unfortunate because of his foreign birth. Altshuler was hired as a, an instructor at $1,000 a year, yes. Uh, and he and his wife, Sophie, moved to Norman to take up uh, his duties. He taught mathematics at the uh, University of Oklahoma from 1916 until uh, his retirement in 1951. He became an American citizen in 1918, probably troubled by the anti-German climate of the World War I years, and although not a German himself, decided to change his German-sounding name and walked from his house on Eufaula Street over to the Norman Courthouse by the railroad track. Uh, according to the legend, uh, perhaps untrue, uh, the judge asked him what uh, uh, he would like his new name to be. Uh, apparently, he had never given the matter much thought, uh, but his eye fell upon a sign that said court. Uh, and he called his wife, she approved, and uh, henceforth, Nathan, uh, Nathan Altshuler was known as Nathan A. Court. Uh, the name uh, change led to a famous story. Uh, he was working the registration desk one fall semester when a student fresh from World War I uh, said he wanted to enroll in geometry, quote, but not with Altshiller, he said. I hear he's a real bastard. Uh, without flinching, Court said, uh, very well. I see there is an opening in Dr. Court's section. Uh, <clears throat> he became a publishing machine, something never seen up to that time in the math department and rarely in the university as a whole. He wrote three books. The best known was called College Geometry, published in 1925, translated into a dozen languages, including Chinese. Soon the standard geometric, uh, geometry, uh, oh, no. geometry uh, textbook across the United States in continuous youth without revision until 1952. 
His second book was called Modern Pure Solid Geometry, published by Macmillan in 1935. I ask you to hold that title in your minds for a few moments. Uh, a third book revealing another side of him was called Mathematics in Fun and Earnest, uh, 1958, a series of his uh, earlier pieces. Uh, he published uh, 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 more than 100 uh, uh, articles in, in uh, a dozen journals, uh, and that did not include dozens of problems that he proposed or solved in uh, numerous uh, journals. His colleague, uh, Eugene Springer, no slouch of a mathematician himself, a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and longtime colleague of uh, Quartz, uh, said uh, that uh, Nathan Court was, quote, a genius in geometry. The one person most responsible for the introduction of a college course in synthetic geometry. Uh, besides technical articles, he wrote uh, uh, a, a lot of thoughtful uh, and uh, non-technical pieces that uh, revealed uh, a lot about the kind of person that he was. Uh, topics like mathematics and aesthetics, 1930. Democratizing Mathematics, 1941. Geometry and Experience, 1945. Mathematics in the History of Civilization, 1948. Is Mathematics an Exact Science, 1948, and, and more than a few others. He taught a course on the history of mathematics and the first words of the first lecture, the, his lecture notes survive, are the history of mathematics is a part of the history of science, which in turn is a part of the intellectual and cultural history of mankind. Uh, Court bore a, a certain uh, physical resemblance to uh, that guy, Albert Einstein. Uh, I'm assuming you can see him, yeah. Uh, and he was occasionally uh, referred to as, uh, uh, as you can see, the uh, Oklahoma's Einstein. And uh, uh, there were sober alumni of this university who stubbornly and uh, proudly insisted that they had taken uh, their geometry at OU from uh, Albert Einstein. <clears throat> Uh, he was a uh, lively and enthusiastic teacher. Uh, uh, completely uh, absorbed by his love of mathematics. He naively expected undergraduates from Oklahoma to share this love. And uh, when he discovered that they didn't, uh, he uh, uh, soon gained the reputation of being a stern and uh, demanding professor. In 1945, when he was earning $3,300 a year, uh, he was denied a raise, and he appealed uh, to President Cross, who turned the matter over to a committee to advise on such matters. The committee wrote to Cross, Dr. Court should establish a better relationship with some of his students in order to merit an increase in salary. Uh, and Cross, who liked and admired uh, Nathan Court and who spoke at his funeral, uh, wrote a, a personal note to Court. I believe the committee feels that you too frequently use sarcasm as a part of your classroom procedure and that the students have complained of this during the past few years. With the good students, it was an entirely different story. John Brixey, who uh, taught math at OU for uh, dozens of years, uh, wrote, I first knew Dr. Uh, Court uh, during his uh, college geometry course in 1922. 
at the time he was working on uh, writing and developing his world famous text. It was a never to be forgotten experience. He would come into the classroom, eyes sparkling through his thick glasses and bubbling over with enthusiasm for the material he was working on and wished you to enjoy. I can see him step away from the blackboard when he reached a point which he wished the student to think about before giving the final conclusion, then tugging at his hair and suddenly saying, well, he would step back to the blackboard, crashing and shattering his chalk at a point on the board as he completed his theorem. Uh, the courts were uh, uh, revered uh, figures on the campus. Backyard uh, hot dog cookouts were famous for their good humor, evenings in their living room, famous for the breadth and depth of their conversation. They loved music, they knew politics and discussed uh, 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 from a position on the far left, uh, every aspect of state, university, nation, and world uh, politics. He uh, was a man with a uh, deep uh, sensitivity for the poor, uh, for the weak and the uh, underprivileged. His uh, best friend at OU, I think it was his best friend, was the uh, university's leading scientist at the time, Rud Nielsen. Uh, said, court took a keen and serious interest in all public affairs. He followed everything and subjected all events to a vigorous logical analysis. He loved literature. He read constantly. He spoke Russian, Polish, Hebrew, French. Once He once taught French, German, English, of course. He late in life learned Italian. They never, the courts never missed a concert or a university play, probably never attended a football game. Uh, he was, in short, a gentle, cultured, scholarly, generous, well-respected citizen of his time at this place. Uh, it's probably a stroke of luck that the first Jewish teacher at the university was such a person. And uh, I hope you will agree that uh, uh, it's uh, not inappropriate that we spend a few moments remembering him and his wife, uh, uh, who was something special too, uh, at an occasion like this. Uh, he died in 1968 at the age of 87. The second Jew hired uh, by the university was destined to be even more uh, famous than Nathan Court. Um, uh, this is Benjamin A. Botkin, uh, born in 1901 in uh, Boston, uh, Massachusetts. His parents were Yiddish-speaking immigrants from Lithuania. His New York cousins were George and Ira Gershwin. Uh, at uh, 16, he got into Harvard on scholarships. This was uh, right before uh, Harvard uh, started instituting those uh, uh, quotas that uh, Steve Norwood, who I know is listening, uh, could uh, enlighten us about. Uh, he. Uh, uh, Graduated from uh, Harvard uh, in 1920, uh, he was 18. He uh, uh, spent a year at Columbia earning a master's degree in literature, but he also studied with uh, Franz Boas, the uh, Jewish pioneering anthropologist, the so-called father of American anthropology. And then at age 20, he took a job as an instructor uh, uh, in English at the University of Oklahoma. It was clear that his ambition at that state in his life was to be a poet. <clears throat> a city boy from his uh, birth, he now found himself 
living on a windswept uh, prairie in an all-white Protestant town village of around 5,000. Soon after arriving, he wrote back home to his relatives, culture in Norman is illusory. <clears throat> He uh, left OU in uh, 1923 to return east, where he worked in settlement houses and taught English to uh, immigrants. But in 1925, uh, he returned uh, to OU, now uh, with a wife. In their book about Bodkin, uh, Lawrence Rogers and Gerald Hirsch write, Yet soon enough, Oklahoma began to awaken something in him, and gradually he would become one of the more endure, uh, and gradually uh, it would become one of the more enduring sources of his scholarly and poetic inspiration. The basis of what would turn out to be his most productive literary period lay in the landscape of his adopted region. He had, as he himself later put it, a near religious conversion to the power of Western topography. The possibilities of Oklahoma as literary material struck me with the force of the Oklahoma wind and stuck to me like a sand burr. Uh, one uh, University president uh, called Botkin very brilliant and energetic. Another said he was one of our ablest men in the field of English literature. Uh, <clears throat> he began making warm and uh, lasting uh, friendships on the campus, was a leader of those who uh, had literary ambitions or interests, and all the while was developing a strong interest in the serious study of American folklore, probably awakened in him by Boas, who uh, approached folklore from an anthropology point of view and was the uh, editor of the Journal of American Folklore. Uh, starting with explorations in Oklahoma culture, uh, folk culture, in 1929, he started a new periodical called Folk Say, one evening, he was at a party, uh, with a faculty party, and he met uh, Joseph Brandt, the newly arrived first editor of the new OU Press. Uh, later, of course, Brandt would become president of the university. But uh, the two started talking as the party was breaking up, and they uh, went somewhere else and talked until dawn. And uh, the first book ever published by the OU Press was uh, called Folk, June 1929, Folk Say, a regional miscellanea, a collection of folk material edi edited by uh, Botkin and starting with his important essay, uh, The Folk in Literature, an Introduction to the New Regionalism. He was an unbelievable uh, writer. Uh, one wonders how he had time to eat. Uh, his bibliography lists around 450 items, poems, reviews, dozens of them in the Daily Oklahoman, scholarly and uh, popular articles, books. Uh, he was a natural leader of uh, a, uh, a new sort of uh, uh, modern folklorist, less interested in traditional searches for uh, the historical origins of discovered pieces of rural or uh, uh, oral culture, uh, and more interested in a wider range of folk culture, handcrafts, technology, social customs, songs, uh, ceremonies, uh, rituals. Uh, Botkin saw uh, folk culture as living and evolving 
as uh, functional in preserving and shaping the life of groups, ethnic and racial groups, regional groups, uh, uh, occupational groups, labor unions, religious groups. For him, folklore in America was a part of the story uh, of uh, the common people of this country, democracy, uh, the way in which uh, it shaped strong self-identity among groups and served regional and ethnic uh, diversity, which he thought was essential for America's strength as a nation. <clears throat> uh, Botkin was even more of a radical than Nathan Court. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, and he became, uh, he was more like a professor, a politically uh, active professor that became common uh, later in uh, academic history. But he, he, the, such a professor was rare in Norman, Oklahoma in uh, the 30s. He joined leftist organizations uh, to oppose Italian fascists and the Nazis. He supported the Spanish Republicans. He spoke out for labor unions and for economic justice and for uh, the civil rights for African Americans. He was not shy about expressing his views. He regularly made the newspapers and this caused certain of the university's board of regents to become nervous. And that in turn caused President Bazell uh, to become uh, nervous uh, too. Uh, in 1937, uh, Botkin uh, uh, achieved uh, one of the prestigious Rosenwald fellowships awarded, five of them, uh, awarded nationally for quote, universe, uh, unusual achievement and promise. He uh, took a uh, leave of absence from the university and he and his wife moved to Washington to research folklore at the uh, Library of Congress. He was quickly acquired by the New Deal and appointed folklore editor of the Federal Writers Project. He asked for and was granted another leave of absence from OU. But by now, Bazell, who was personally friendly with uh, Botkin, quite friendly, uh, was urging him not very subtly uh, not to come back, not to return to Norman. Uh, a letter to uh, his friend. Uh, when the Board of Regents was considering the budget here in May, one of the regents brought up the question of your loyalty to our democratic institutions. I stated to the board that I doubted that you would return next year. Uh, Botkin was earning more in Washington than he was in uh, Norman, and the Botkins had two children that they had to think about. Uh, uh, Bazell continues, I rather thought when you got the notification that your salary would remain stationary, you probably would resign. Uh, moreover, uh, the regent uh, in question uh, uh, told uh, Bazell confidentially that if it were not for the assurance that uh, you would resign, uh, he would uh, go public with the information he had about your, uh, quote, radical tendencies. Uh, the year before, uh, Botkin's name had flashed across the moving electric sign on the engineering building because he had been named as a member of the Communistic uh, League for Peace and Democracy. Uh, this, uh, Bazell wrote to him, this has provoked considerable discussion here. <clears throat> uh, although he insisted, I am not a communist, uh, Botkin took uh, Bazell's advice and resigned on September 1st, 1940, after 19 years on the OU faculty. Uh, six years later, he joined a group at the height of the Cold War advocating friendship between the Soviet Union and America. 
and he wrote to one of his Norman friends, Savoy Lautenfeld, director of the OU Press and a famous name in OU history. Uh, he wrote to his friend, uh, I am not joining Stalin's legions or anyone's legions for that matter. However, I am not one to stick my head in the sand. As often in Oklahoma, I'm inclined to stick my neck out when the occasion demands it. In this case, I felt it was my duty and right as a writer and citizen to join with other writers in speaking for world peace and Soviet American amity, which is the basis for world peace. From 1942 uh, to 1945, uh, Botkin served as the Library of Congress Director of the Archive for American Folk Song. He put together uh, his famous book, uh, A Treasury of American Folklore. Perhaps you know this book. It was I grew up with it in my father's library. Uh, introduction by Carl Sandburg, the most popular folklore book ever published in the United States. Uh, he used the royalties to quit the Library of Congress and settle in uh, a village, Cruton on the Hudson, and he devoted himself to writing. In 1945, he used the Federal Writers Project 1930s interviews with surviving former slaves uh, to uh, issue his uh, very widely read Lay My Burden Down, A Folk History of Slavery. Uh, he published books uh, on New England folklore, folklore 47, Southern folklore, folklore uh, 1949, Western folklore 1951, Railroad folklore 1953, New York City folklore 1956, Mississippi River folklore 1957, Civil War, 1960. Botkin died in 1975 at the age of 74. It was <clears throat> no doubt inevitable that these two men, Court and Botkin, should have been drawn together. Uh, Jewish pioneers in an unlikely place, an immigrant and a son of immigrants. Both of them had uh, richly uh, earned files with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, both were uh, gregarious, gifted conversationalists, cultured, uh, and with a uh, talent for friendship. I ask you to bear in mind Nathan Court's uh, 1935 book title, in case you have forgotten. Uh, it was a modern, pure, solid geometry uh, published by Macmillan. Ben Botkin took the occasion to write a humorous poem for his friend. It takes more than optometry to make me see through geometry, whether it's solid or plain, to me it's all vain. But of one thing I'm sure, if it's modern and pure, in art, science, or morals, I bestow on it laurels. How to be modern and how to be pure is the moralist's woe and the artist's lure. The purest of moderns are apt to be squalid, but not your geometry, modern and solid. Said Macmillan, are you willing, pure and solid with us, Nathan? Pure and solid as our faith in, pure and solid? Answered court, pure and solid, I am for it. Pure and solid is our fort, solid be his sales report. Pure and solid be the sport of making books for Nathan Court. So much then uh, for uh, a uh, brief look at uh, early Jewish presence on uh, the campus of the University of Oklahoma. The students who came here from uh, places all over the country and created a lively social community, 
the philanthropist whose uh, generosity uh, did such a great deal to make this place uh, what it is today, a respectable institution of higher education, and the first two extraordinary teachers and scholars, each in his own discipline, uh, receiving international recognition, and who, uh, by virtue of their reputations and their personal popularity, may well, I don't think this is saying too much, may well have paved the way for other Jewish faculty to be offered jobs in Norman and uh, in some important ways helped pro uh, prepare the ground for the creation of the Judaic Studies program uh, that we celebrate uh, today. Uh, thank you for your patience. I realize I've gone uh, too long, but I appreciate your listening. David. David, thank you so much. David, wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, we really appreciate your uh, time and original research into this. And of all the, uh, of all the topics that you, you touched on today, I can think of another several that I'm going to probably, uh, probably hit you up for in the future. Um, so I want to uh, just thank <laughs> Alan, one uh, brief interruption. I want to say a special thanks to Trice Hyman for uh, teaching me his most inept student of all time how to use this PowerPoint. Thank you, Trice. I really do appreciate it. Go on. You're welcome, David. <laughs> Trice is the man behind the scenes in all our endeavors. And uh, even though you said my uh, intro was a bit uh, much, I forgot to to mention one of the most relevant things, and that is that David Levy is also the author of the official history of the University of Oklahoma, two volumes already out, and uh, God willing, a third on the way. So um, let me just thank everybody for coming. Uh, uh, and uh, I took a while, and, and uh, Dean Robel took a while to introduce, and thank you, Lynn, for coming. So I, I think um, questions for David uh, Levy, you should send to him or send to me and I'll forward them to him. And I think that's, uh, that would be the best procedure for today. So I want to thank everybody for being here. We, 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 we did the best we could with the technology and uh, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, it's good that um, we had some people from uh, other continents who otherwise maybe couldn't have joined us or would have had to have just heard this uh, via video recording. So thank you all very much. Thank you, especially David Levy. Thank you.